Welcome to the Class of the Little Sass podcast. I'm your host, Carrie Millspaw, best-selling author and award-winning motivational speaker with over 20 years in the personal development industry. I believe that the more you know, the more you grow. With each podcast episode, I will educate and empower you, girlfriend to girlfriend style, on how to create a happy life from motherhood guidance, career and business advice, to feeling confident in your relationships and everything in between. This is Real Talk Radio. Let's jump right into today's episode. Hi, my friends. You're going to love today's episode. And thank you, first and foremost, for being here. If you've always had that desire in your heart of how to write a book, and you've always wanted to be an author, or you see someone publish their first book or 10th book or whatever that looks like, and you've seen it on social media, and you're like, gosh, that's really, really cool. I've always wanted to do that. And for some reason, and I was this way before I became a published author, you kind of put it out there like, I've got to be a celebrity or I've got to be this, you know, somebody special kind of girl or who am I to even write a book? And, you know, I'll take it a step back here. I'm a bookworm. So I might put authors a little higher on a pedestal than most, but I still didn't have that feeling like there was some reason why I shouldn't write a book. But As you see more and more people become authors, I want you to take away this yumminess that this is possible for me. When you see other people reaching for the stars or getting a goal accomplished, I want you to be inspired, not jealous. Don't compare. They're showing you what's possible for you as well. Okay. When someone shines their light, it doesn't mean there's not, oh, we can't have any more people with lights. Okay. Sorry. We're, we're, We're capped out, y'all. Go hide in the dark somewhere. You can't shine your light because I'm too busy over here shining my light. That's not the rules. That's just a dumb belief that we make up in our head sometimes. So I want you to embrace the fact that if you've always wanted to be a published author, I'm giving you permission today. Okay? Got it? You get to be a published author. Permission to be you, just like my upcoming book. Okay, so I wrote my first book. It was published in 2016. I have then helped so many clients publish their books, get them out there, and I am so close to getting the next one out there finally. I did a little bit, you know, I go against the grain here a little bit of my own advice of of filling your own cup before you pour from your cup and putting others before you and the boundaries and all the things, the self-love stuff. And I'll be honest, I put a lot of clients' needs before mine. I put my dad's published book before mine, which is fine. I'm not complaining. That was the best daddy-daughter project ever was helping dad publish his book. So of course I'm putting mine out there. Finally, the second one It's kind of like a redemption book. I feel like I'm, I'm coming out with the book I wanted to write all those years ago, back in 2015, 2016. So I feel like it's a second edition of what I didn't say in the first book. And it's a little, it is a redemption project. Clearly it is redeeming myself and course correcting some of the things I didn't love about the first book. You know, they're just, again, I have to get it out there. The Lord has pressed this on me in such a way that it must be published. And what's interesting is, and I know I'm going off a little bit off on a side trail here, the enemy doesn't want me to publish this book. Boy, have that distraction shown up. In fact, just last night as I was saving my content on my laptop, just kind of backing things up onto a flash drive for safety sake. And I was going through cleaning up some files, making room on my hard hardware. And all of a sudden my entire personal folder of all my goodies was gone. (laughs) <laughs> book stuff, dad's book stuff, business accounting stuff, C, you know, stuff for my CPA and taxes, all gone. Um, I'm not going to lie. I was up till about one or two in the morning last night, freaking out just a little on the inside. And it wasn't in your normal recycle for, folder, just so you know, because usually you can just go to the recycles folder, find the folder and recover it. It's that simple. But no, Miss Carrie was Googling online of how to find it last night freaking out, not freaking out, but having a little panic, those panic butterflies in your tummy, like, uh, where else did I save it? I do think I had 
a more recent version saved on Google Drive as well. Always save things to clouds and multiple clouds, not just one, just in case. So I had to step away because I was panicking a minute and I had to go like, have a moment. Okay, Lord, take over this situation for me. I'm not going to let myself get all bent out of shape and freaking out. Came back and I don't even know, I tripped into a whole nother section of my OneDrive and load, found something that re- helped me recover everything. I was Googling like search options to try to find this. So it's interesting how the enemy will try to kind of derail you and pull you back. That's when you know it's supposed to happen, right? That's when you got to push through and make Jesus happy. Screw that, the enemy. Screw him. Tell him where he needs to go. So If you are that person and you want to join me on the fun adventure of getting your book out there, and it is one of those income streams that you do the work once, you get paid on it forever. So that's smart, smart business, period. But I want you to do it for the right reasons. I, this isn't about Carrie. The message never is. I'm the conduit. Jesus is the light. I just get to shine his light through me. I'm his voice. I'm his hands and feet. The Bible talks about that often being the hands and feet of Jesus. It's all about him. 100% my entire life. Once I realized it's not about me, it's about the message flowing through me. It takes everything else away. The fear of being vulnerable, the fear of public speaking, the fear of putting yourself out there, the fear of being judged. All of it goes away when you realize it's for Jesus. You're just his messenger. Takes the pressure off you a little bit too, because it's so much bigger than you then. And takes, takes away that fear of anxiety. If you're very introverted and very shy and you're not the type to put yourself out there, it kind of, let, let it be a God thing. You know, God's the buffer here. Let the Holy Spirit do his job. And that's, that's when it gets easier. 100%. So if you've always wanted to do this, and it's something you get to, even if, it, even if the ambition or the motivation behind it is to just leave a legacy behind for your kids, grandkids, whatever that looks like, family, or you just want to tell a story about your history, or you just want to write fictional books, whatever that looks like. The hardest part, my friend, is starting. And I do want to mention real quick, if you're a video person and you like prefer YouTube and watching things and learning that way, I'm going to insert in the, in the show notes a link to my my video that I did, gosh, ooh, a while ago now, 2020, I think it was around the, around the pandemic because that's when I started diving back into writing again. All of a sudden we had lots of extra time too, right? So I'm going to insert the link to the YouTube video in the show notes. If you'd like to watch my little five steps that direction, it's not going to be exactly the same of, of me sharing today because I never say the same thing twice. You know, it's just is what it is. It's like giving a keynote. I never, they're never the same. I, um, I'm an authentic person that likes to just let things flow. So step one, if you're looking into becoming an author and starting is the hardest part, because let's be honest, we just get into overwhelm, you know, that, that, oh my goodness, I don't even know what I would write about, or I could do this, I could do that. And then just your brain starts to go in 20 directions. So then you do nothing, right? The overwhelm creates nothing. We get stuck. We just get kind of caught up in that paralysis analysis where we don't even get anything done. And I don't want that to happen to you. If this is something that's been on your bucket list for a long time, sister, join me. Join me in the author club. I've been in it a long, long time. It's kind of fun. And helping my dad write his book brought me so much joy and he's, you know, passes it out to anyone that wants one. And it's just a door opener for him. Um, it's just, if you could see the smile on my face, it just brings me so much happiness to know that's going to be around forever. You know, it's just a part of grandpa forever. His own grandkids have read the book and said, I never knew that about grandpa, or I've read lots of books on faith, but I never read one like this. This one hit me in a different way. So Again, it's just the gift that keeps on giving, whether it's financial or emotional abundance, it's there. It's there, my friends. It's there for you. So step one, first kind of get clear. And you know, again, I'm picturing you with your journal or your writing. And if you're not, it's okay. And you're on a walk, walking your dog or driving your kids to wherever, and you're listening to this right now, be sure to take the time to write these steps down. 
and come back to it and kind of let, I like to let things marinate. I like to make, write something in my journal, let it marinate, come back to it. That's might be your way too. You know, it's all good. So step one is really getting clear. What's the rev, what is the relevance of writing my book? What topic will you be uncovering? What is your long-term game plan? If you want to write a book just to say you did, that's probably not the best reason. I'm going to ask you to go back to the drawing board and start over. You know, think of me as your teacher right now. What is the relevance? What is the purpose? I I always ask my clients, like, what's going on here? And sometimes they're like, well, I just want to write a memoir of my life because I went through all this, this, and this. And someone should read it because they're going to learn from me. Good start. But dot, 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 (laughs) if you're not a celebrity, no one's going to buy your memoir just because you think about like Demi Moore. I read hers not that long ago. She's already known. Of course, her story's interesting. It has relevance because she's famous. Um, No different than any other famous person. You know, I think I have a few others that I have uh, purchased as well for the same reason. I can't say I've always read them, but same thing. Uh, Beth Moore, big fan, read her memoir instantly. As soon as I got it, couldn't wait to open it up because I love her. She's been my favorite Bible teacher for decades. And of course, I couldn't wait to rip open that book and read it, devoured it. Love her dearly. It was a peek into her heart, not just her teachings. So if you're thinking memoir type book, if you already have a brand, you're, you've got a following, people know you, then yes, do that. If you want to tell your story somehow, some way, I suggest doing it the way I do it. It's kind of a reverse backwards approach of turning it into a self-help book and then sprinkling it with your stories. Have a structure in place so that people are learning from your mistakes, your journey, your challenges, your overcomeness, all those things, right? <laughs> Everything you've you, all the fires you've been through and come out on the other side unscathed, do it in a structure that actually is bite-sized chunks of some type of self-help guide, personal development industry. Okay. I highly recommend that. Inspiration is yummy. Not going to lie. Everyone wants a little good dose of inspiration, a little dose of education, always turns into motivation. That's kind of my three building blocks with everything I do, whether it's a keynote speech or I'm writing a book, blog, podcast, episode. Again, that mix of inspiration combined with education creates motivation. When people know what to do and they're inspired to do it, they're going to go run and do it. You know, that momentum shows up. So I highly encourage you to do that. If you're not interested in the personal development space at all, or maybe it's just a how-to book, If you're doing just a simple how-to book, how to build your business in five steps, you know, maybe it's that quick book where people get to grab it and learn whatever, or um, to how to have a more abundant mindset or the money, work on their money mindset, or how to have better relationships, how to have a a long lasting marriage, how to embrace motherhood and how that gets to look. That's a how-to book. That's kind of what I I define it or give it that label as a how-to book. Also, even if you do step one, step two, step three, sprinkle in the story, sprinkle in, if it's not your personal stories, maybe a personal story from a client, you know, name doesn't have to be relevant, but a lot of the great books I like that, like the power of a praying mom. Um, I really like those books, the power of prayer books. She encompasses her clients stories and she may give them a name, a fake name, but you don't need to name anyone. I don't name anyone in my in my books. I rarely ever do. Um, I might say my dad, my sister, my daughter, my clients, my ex-boyfriend, my ex-husband. I don't really name names. That's irrelevant to the story or the experience. It's not about them anyway. It's my perspective. So you're getting it from me. And you know that's the clarity I want to help you get as you get into the relevance of writing your book and and where where does that really get to get to live? Where does that book get to live in the book world? Think of your book living on a bookshelf somewhere in Barnes and Noble or any bookstore for that matter. Is it going to be in the science fiction section? Is it going to be in the 
love and relationship section? Is it going to be in the religion section? Is it going to be in personal development? Is it going to be in the fiction section? Maybe you want to write a bunch of novels about vampires or Harry Potter, you know, like look how successful those have been. That's where I want you to get clear. What bookshelf section is my book going to live, whether it's virtual and online or in an actual bookstore, get clear on that. Cause that's step one, 100%. Step two. Actually, let me just pause. There's a little more I want to squeeze out of step one. I want to know what your end result is. If this is a book, and this is this, this I'm speaking for multiple clients. I'm writing it because Carrie, I want it to open up doors for me. Maybe I've had a lot of clients in my past that have wanted to speak more in stages, get more visibility for their brand, get out into the media. You know, I, I've had a publicity company for years. We work on that. Doors are great doors. Books are great door openers. They're little keys that just kind of unlock opportunities. Whether it's, again, speaking in front of thousands of people about it, doing a quick media interview, a quick blog about it, a press release, whatever. Is it going to bring you more clients? Is it going to bring you more visibility so you can have more business? Is it going to buy you more product, going to get you more products sold? Think about the relevance and the purpose. Because I'll be honest, most authors are not going to get rich off their selling their book. There's got to be more to it. And I probably will publish more future podcast episodes around how you can make more money off your book. Okay. So kind of keep, we'll put a pin in that for another time. So it's not just book sales. Let's just put it that way. So think long-term. If that's what you want to do is just become a New York Times bestseller and become rich and retire from your book. Not saying that's not possible. You might have noticed a little pause there as I'm rewording my thoughts, but it's highly unlikely. It's just a little less chance. Okay. I'm not going to limit you. Not going to put any limits on your beliefs. And I'm definitely not going to limit your goals or dreams. But realistically, long term, anything's possible. But also know that realistically <laughs> and logically, We've got to think of other avenues for streams of income as well as writing this book. So books don't have to be expensive to publish. Books don't have to be expensive to write unless you work with a publisher. You know, sometimes they want to take a big chunk of your cash flow to do that for you and rightfully slow, rightfully should because it's expensive, time consuming on their end to do all of this. So, so think of that. What's the long-term game plan? not just where your book's going to live in the bookshelf land. Okay. So step two, most people don't know where to start or stop when it comes to writing a book. Do I start once upon a time? Do I start when I, once upon a time I was born? Where's the ending? That's another one too. This is where most people start and stop. I don't know where to start Carrie and I don't know when to stop. Like if it's about my life, my life's still going. I'm not dead yet. What, what do what I do? What do I, where, where you're going to have to stop eventually, right? Or you'll never finish that book and get it on a bookshelf. So this is the best advice out of the entire podcast that you will get. And I did this with myself. I did this with my next book. I did this with clients and I did this with my beloved father that didn't know where to start or stop either. He just knew he wanted to write a book. You need to chunk it up, section it up. It's so much more digestible for your reader and it's so much more easier to write it out. You will not get overwhelmed easily and it'll be an easier project for you to start and stop, set it on a shelf, come back to it, work on a little bit more, start, stop, and so on. What does that look like when you chunk it up? I have sections to my books, like a part one, part two, part three, part four. And in those parts, I'll have three little mini chapters. Now, for example, like part one, permission to be intuitive, I believe is the first section. And then I break it up into little tiny, think of it as like a blog. Those chapters are just a blog about a topic. That, my friend, especially if you're a writer like me, is easier to just kind of get your head around with a start stop than a big long story that just never seems to end and you just don't you feel like you're gonna miss all the good stuff and you're skipping parts and pieces and it feels so the timeline feels off take it take my advice on this seriously it's so much easier in fact it's gonna get you excited once you have that clarity i did the same thing with my dad 
It was the Christmas after his accident in 2016, where we just sat down and said, okay, dad, just start telling me fun stories, inspirational stories, because that's all his book is. It's stories about letting the spirit lead, the stories of the Holy Spirit leading your life and stepping out in faith and allowing the Lord to guide your steps. So it's a bunch of stories that are very faith-filled and inspiring. So I knew it was going to be easy, but I wanted it to still flow from, from, you know, a certain age in his life to present day. I didn't want to start with a current story and then jump all over to when he was nine. And then when he was four, I wanted to still have somewhat of a flow and a timeline. So get that clear in your head of a timeline. Then look at what topics do I want to cover? Mine are all permit my my second book is called permission to be all of me it's a self-help guide it's a girlfriend guide okay for self self-help self-love all the things and i just broke it up into sections where i wanted to talk about certain topics that are near and dear to my heart like permission to be a woman of faith permission to be intuitive where i get to talk about being an empath permission to be divorced permission to be single you know these are all the sections of of the areas in my own journey of self-help and growth where I had to get permission to be this label I gave myself. Permission to be abundant is one of them. And you can see as I, I will narrow it down in those sections, I will create three more chapters within those sections, which are just short and sweet blogs in my mind. And even those blogs within the blogs, you could break it up into little tiny stories like, Sometimes it's just easier to say oh, that one time this happened, you know, or, or the time my car broke down and then you just go into that mini story. And these beautiful stories are self-help guides that also not only am I sharing myself, my own personal life and story, it's not a memoir, but I'm letting you see the growth through my experience. So you can paint, you know, painting the picture for your readers is fun. It helps them adapt, relate, and put themselves in the picture. They cannot learn from you if they don't feel they can relate to the story. And again, they will not feel if they relate to the story. If you don't tell the story in the first place, you got to tell it, got to be vulnerable, got to share it. That's when people go, oh, I can relate. I've been there. Oh, I remember when I did that. How did she recuperate from that? Or how did she bounce back? Oh, okay. I was thinking the same thing. Okay. This is a new belief. We're going to change it up. I see her perspective now and you don't have to do this piece, but I thought in my book, it would be nice to have a little checkpoint, a little roadmap at the end of each chapter to again, course correct so that they're not just taking Carrie's story and regurgitating that and putting it on a shelf as well. That happened to Carrie and that's not relatable to me. I wanted the the women that read my book and men, I know you're out there to also have a guide or roadmap to, if this happened to me, how would I react? How would I get back on track again? How would I feel better about myself, heal and recover from this situation? If it, if it happened to me already, or if it might happen to you in the future, now you have the tools of how to adjust and, and, you know, course correct through that process. So that's a self-help guidebook. If you want to write a fictional story, you're going to want maybe three big sections, beginning, the middle, and the end of what that looks like, whether it's a journey of a character, but chunk it up, chunk up the first half of that, or the first third of that story, the middle, and then the, the last third. Three sections seem to work really well for my clients when they're doing fictional stories because the climax is, tends to be in the middle, right? Though who did it or what's going on and all the mystery. You know, the first is the intro. That first section is the intro. That first third is the buildup of getting to know the characters and understand what's going on. Maybe it's a mystery or a psychological thriller, which I love to read, not going to lie. Boy, did I give a lot of those away during my move, but you want to get that build up. And then the middle is that, oh my gosh, that page turner time where you're just like, who did it? What's happening? What's going on? Are they getting married? What's going on? I don't know what's happening. Did somebody die? I think it was the butler, you know, just all the silly 
the crazy in the middle. And then that tail end where all of it comes full circle and you get all your answers to the whodunit psychological thriller stuff or, or they're ta-da, the happily ever after they're getting married, you know, whatever that looks like builds up that way. And again, chunk it up by chapter sections, chapters, sections, chapters. Do you, does that make sense? Or you call it a category versus a section, whatever that makes you feel best and look at the layout. And you know, what's fun is when you're going to, it's time to write, you're going to have this, Ooh, I just have to write this one little mini blog, you know, what shoot out. I can knock out 600, 800 words. That's it. That's all I have to do today. And you'll get to start biting, biting, literally little tight bite-sized chunks to getting this book written. You'll feel so good about yourself because now you're making progress. You're seeing progress. No writer can look at a blank page and just go, oh crap. I hope I get inspired. <laughs> Maybe one day I'll just, one of these days I'll stop staring at this screen. It kind of reminds me of the movie, The Shining, you know, <laughs> all work and no play makes Jack a doll boy, you know? So that's what I think he was typing over and over again, right? Here's Johnny. Sorry. I'm it's a, it's literally days be, before Halloween. So all that's going through my mind right now. You can see where my head's at. So don't do that to yourself. You'll start to get frustrated. Writer's block is a real deal. There is such a thing. It's not a myth and it's painful because then you put more pressure on yourself and then you start to procrastinate more and you can feel it in your body. Once you just start going, the flow shows up. Okay. Which leads me into step three. Save the title for last. Sometimes that's your inspirational mark and it can be, but I want you to, if you have it, write it down. That's fine, but be loose with it. Don't make it finite. Don't go out and start getting graphic designers to create your book cover just yet. Save that for last because as your book is written and evolves, you will start to feel the title come to you. That's what we did with my dad. His was just kind of a, I don't know, I don't really want it to be only a Christian title. I kind of want it to be loose, loosely, you know, just kind of a hook that grabs you, but tells you what it is. And her, and his book title is to be eaten alive was my fear, not my faith. And it didn't come to us till the very end. Literally we were in the middle. The book was pretty much written. We were getting ready to have a hire a graphic designer to do the book cover. And it was finally coming to him. He shot it out. In fact, I'll never forget the day that he just called me out of the blue, which isn't something he does often on his little flip phone. Carrie, I know what it is. And I'm sure he called me by my nickname more than Carrie, but because that's just how he is. But I think I've got it. Call me back, you know? And, and I was like, what? Okay, dad, but it's got to have some description to it, so that, which is where the tagline comes from. I highly recommend you do a headline that's short and sweet to the point grabs your attention, but then the tagline describes the headline, you know, his to be eaten alive, real short and sweet. That's the big, bold letters you see on the spine of the book. And then the tagline is, was my fear, not my faith kind of describes it. And if you know about his story, you'll understand the title a little bit better, but so just kind of be loose with that. Don't get so caught up in it. Trust me, sister. It'll evolve. It'll come to you. Save it for last. You're going to change your mind about five times, maybe more, and just kind of let it unfold as you write out your book and, and kind of visualize who your readers will be. Then you can create that catchy title. And if you have a marketing consultant that you need a little help with, even better, or someone that's consulting you through this process, even better. I um, am working on another digital course just for authors. Again, something you can do in your own terms and your own time frame, but yet still get the guidance of a coach holding your hand. So step four is, and this one's important, write when you're inspired. Inspired action is better than pushed action. And I tr trust me when I say this, your writing content will be much better quality. When I'm in that flow state, my writing I actually will go back and read and go, gosh, who wrote that? I don't even remember writing that. It just was flowing through me from Jesus, you know, just downloads from heavenly downloads across the keyboard. 
I would like, to, I like to write late at night. I'm a night person anyway, but there's also that if I don't have to get up early the next day, of course, if I don't have a deadline or anything of that nature, but if I have some freedom in my schedule and I can write late into the night where the house is quiet, nobody needs me. My phone isn't blowing up. I'm, I don't have to keep looking at the clock because I'm missing an appointment or another scheduled call with a client or I'm, or there's other things pulling at me like, oh, I need to get groceries today. I need to do this, this, and that too. And I didn't start dinner. That's not the time to sit down and write, sister. You need to write and flow. And that's why so many authors disappear. You'll see them take off and into the mountains at a, a big hotel in, in Colorado somewhere, otherwise known as the movie, The Shining. No, I have to just keep, keep joking about that. Um, some go off to a hotel and hide out. Beth Moore does this. She'll go to the beach or wherever. Sometimes she brings just her dog. And she talks about this quite a bit in her Bible study teachings where she's got to write and she just wants to sit with Jesus and, and get this knocked out without life interrupting her. I love that idea. In fact, huh, maybe that's what's, that's what I'm missing to get that, that last little bit done is um, an escape in the mountain somewhere, you know? It's hard to go somewhere without any signal because you're going to need Wi-Fi unless you're just writing and not needing to look up any references or I need internet. Um, but if you're just maybe writing from your laptop in, in a Microsoft Word document or whatever that looks like. But if you're using Google Docs, you're going to still need Wi-Fi. So sure, go find that cabin in the woods somewhere without a signal. That's fine too. Whatever works for you. I prefer a signal. I can't completely go off the grid. It's just a part of me. And this maybe it's a single mom thing rooted in me that what if my kid needs me, even though she's 19 years old, what if she needs me in my family or whatever? I never want to completely go off the grid either by myself somewhere. That just sounds spooky and scary. What if the boogeyman gets me? So find that inspiration piece. Find your sweet spot. I'll never forget. I knocked out my first book in two all-nighters, two all-nighters. They were six months apart from each other because I needed the book to marinate for a little bit. You know, like that's going to happen. You're going to write a lot, let it sit for a while, write a lot, let it sit for a while, let the book, some say just, you know, like let it cook, let it marinate, let it, just put it away for a while, sit on it. Because when you come back, you'll get a fresh new perspective again. You're seeing it again through fresh eyes. You have to sometimes get that outside perspective and step away for a little while, come back to it. I, a lot of the time, just freeload, just dump, just write, 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 come back and trim it up because it's like too much of, too much content on one specific topic. Do your brain dump, come back, tighten it up or have another editor come and do that for you. It's the best. It really is. And again, do it when you're inspired. Pushed energy does not create a really good book. Do it when the flow is there where you can really feel into it. It's such a magical space to be in. I know those that run have this runner's high. I have a writer's high. It's just, don't talk to me. I'm in it. I did 30, was it 30 pages? Oh my God, not too long ago, right before I moved. And I remember my daughter and her boyfriend playing Super Mario Kart right next to me in my loft office at the time didn't hear anything. I was in the zone. Didn't hear it. Just shoo, just zoned in writing out a story that happened. I wanted to write it while it was still fresh and just knocking it out. I still have yet to go back and trim that up because we don't want 30 pages of that, but that's the way to do it. And then I can cherry pick the content that's the juiciest to keep for the book. Again, inspired. I was in it. I couldn't sleep. I had to just get it done. You know, that's inspired action always better. Don't put this pressure on yourself. Unless of course, even then, if you have a deadline with the publisher and you're working with them, they've already paid you up front. They need so many pages or so many chapters by a certain date to collect your next paycheck and so on. I get it. Do what you got to do to get away though. Away from the distractions, away from the deadlines, away from the day-to-day -day trappings of looking at the clock all the time. I highly recommend giving yourself that breathing room. It's good stuff. Good stuff. And last but not least, step five, self-publish, guys. Sure, it's fun to work with a publisher. They're going to help you. But at the end of the day, you're still going to have to market the crap out of yourself. They'll expect you to do that. A publisher will have a name. If there's perks. Don't get me wrong. There's always perks. And especially if they're going to pay you ahead of time, give you a deposit. 
that's a great perk. But if you don't have those features set up, you're not already somebody, somebody's not coming to, you know, knocking down your door because they want your story and they're going to pay you this much money for it. Take the pressure off yourself and just self-publish. Amazon has made it so much easier than ever and so cost efficient to get your book out there. Now, yes, you can always go backwards, pull it from the shelves and get it picked up later by a publishing house. That's completely 100% relevant and relatable. But, and of course, if that seems even more daunting, you can outsource help and get it on Amazon quickly without the controlling relationship that some publishers have with their authors. A lot of my past clients have learned the hard way. So there's pros and cons. Pros are, yes, it's nice to jump on that bandwagon, but the cons can be, they own it. They own the cover. They own the content. You can't go in and make changes. I love that freedom that I self-published. I can pull it off the shelves if I want to, the virtual shelves. I don't have my book in any actual bookstores that I know of. I probably do, but they were probably purchased privately. I like that option to go, and I did this recently with my dad's book. He's like, you know, Carrie, I don't know why I missed this chunk of, you know, when I built the church and all the things, when, you know, from my childhood. I'm like, you know what, dad, let's knock it out. It's not too late. It's been published for a while. We'll just call it a bonus edition and we're going to add it in. It's okay. We can add this in. I'll reformat the content. We'll throw it in there because self-publishing through Amazon is a print on demand process. So it's simple and easy to make updates. I can go in there right now. When I, If I found a typo, I could go in there right now and correct it so that future publications that are printed out and future copies will be corrected going forward. You don't have that kind of freedom so much with the publisher. So contemplate the pros and cons, do your due diligence online, see if that's really the route you want to go. And also just know there are people that will help you format it. They were, I have so many wonderful graphic designers to get you your perfect book cover, all the things. And again, reach out if you need help with that publishing type of piece. I would hate for you to get stuck in the details and never get this out there. And yes, it's going to cost you some coin to have some assistance, but is it, is it, it's still cheaper than regret, right? That heaviness of regret. Why didn't I do this? Now it's too late for me. I'm sick and I can't get this done or whatever, or I don't have the extra cash flow now to get this done. It's worth it. If you've got, you know, a couple grand in your pocket, get up, get an editor in place. Um, it doesn't have to cost you ten, twenty thousand dollars to do this and just do what you can when you can. It's worth it. Oh my God. It's so worth it. And there's something about the end of all of the process. When you get to hold your book, it literally, my friends, is like going through labor to get these books published. I swear mine's been three years and counting <laughs> a lot longer than a baby. But once you get to hold that book in your hands, it is like holding your baby. You're like, I birthed a book. Look at me. It's so good. It's so good. And even if only five people get help from your book, it's worth it. When they circle back and tell you, oh my gosh, I learned so much from this. Thank you. Thank you. That emotional abundance is priceless. Nothing can top that. Nothing can match it. And of course you can always make a ton, you know, you're going to make ebbs and flows of money. You can really push it, really peak, make some good cash flow. And then take, give it a break, go back at it again, get some media out there, get some more traction again, boom, all of a sudden you skyrocket the sales again. I mean, I, I've done this with my dad's book. It's kind of a, looks like, you know, mounts, mountains, peaks and valleys. We got him in a hunting magazine called um, Deers, Deer and Deer Hunting. I can't remember. Um, took his story and he's like, what happened? I got a, you know, a lot of all of a sudden my bank bank um, income for the book really like just peaked, skyrocketed. Well, dad, you were in a magazine, you know, and it pointed everybody to buy your book. So you're going to see there was a good couple months of good solid sales after that magazine article was released. So it's good stuff, guys. It's good stuff. If you've got a message that you want to give out to the world, I'm from the self-development industry. I don't relate so well to the fictional side. I love to read your books, but I'm not that, that's not my writing niche. That's not where I excel. I relate to you because you've got a passion to do it. And I definitely have the imagination for it. I'm more of your key audience. I will read your book, 
but I probably am not going to write fiction. But if you're a nonfiction self-help guru like me, and you just have to help people, it fills your bucket. It fills your soul. Don't wait any longer. And again, if you want to kind of save this, maybe somewhere to come back to, or your YouTube, YouTube junkie like me, go in the show notes, watch the video I have on it that I did a few years ago. Super relevant today may have a few extra stories in there that I didn't share today, but I want you to be an author too. Come join me. It's good stuff. One bite at a time. That's how we do it, guys, over here. One little baby step at a time. Every little puzzle piece God gives you, just one at a time, put it in place. He's going to give you the next one. It's all doable. Don't let overwhelm stop you from getting your message out to the world. Hope you enjoyed this. Share it with a friend or anyone else that you know that's thinking of writing a book and just ha- just don't know where to start. They're just stuck. Big hugs, big love. See you in the next episode. Hi there, friend. If you enjoyed this episode, do me a favor and double check that you're subscribed or following. And if you've got a quick 30 seconds, it would mean the world to me if you could leave me a five-star review and share what you specifically liked about this episode. 